everybody. This is Shimri Yoyo with exercise.com. And we are continuing our interview series with fitness experts. And today we have Steve Cotter of the International Kettleball and Fitness Federation. Thank you, Steve, for joining us today. Hi, Shimri. Thanks for inviting me. My pleasure to be here. All right. Well, um, just start off with, can you give us a, um, a little summary of your background in martial arts? Uh, yeah. So, well, I'm 49 years old now. Um, I started studying in Chinese martial arts when I was 12 years old. And I did that religiously for uh, close to 20 years. Um, I was studying what's called internal martial arts. So it combines the martial art with, with the meditation, breathing exercise, uh, use of certain types of therapy like um, acupressure, massage, um, use of topical herbs. So it's a very comprehensive uh, system. And then uh, I moved away from the martial arts uh, in my early 30s, and I moved into fitness as my as my profession. And then uh, recently, in the in the past year and a half, I came back to the martial arts again, studying jujitsu, which I currently study. Um, so, it's uh, martial arts was been very instrumental in my development and my exposure to you know, physical training and physical culture, as well as uh, East meets West, sort of a holistic approach, which I apply also to my fitness training. Okay, well, that's that's great. Uh, so you got a lot of longevity and you got back on there. It's like uh, riding a bike. It took a little break, but uh, it came back to you. Yeah, yeah. It actually brought me back to the roots. You know, I, I, I was always doing martial arts in the middle. What happened is I... I ultimately created my own style but I, I didn't realize at the time that I was still doing the martial arts for me the kettlebell gave me an avenue uh, to apply the martial arts in a in a different way you can say in a way that was not necessarily martial as in fighting but martial as in the movement and the intention and the mind body so I've really been doing martial arts the whole time but for for a period of more than 15 years, I was sort of a practitioner without a school or without, without a brotherhood. You know, I was teaching, but I wasn't studying as a student. So now, now I'm back to being a student again. So it's, I can say it's been a full circle journey. And I, I, don't, I don't foresee myself ever stepping away from the arts again. All right. That's great. Um, that's a unique and interesting way to put it. Um, so that's, um, that actually brings me to my follow-up question. Um, how did you then um, translate your passion for martial arts? How did that um, transfer to you becoming involved with sports performance as the trainer slash coach slash t uh, teacher? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, so when I came to the arts, I was really, you know, I was very young. I was 12 years old and that, that had really shaped uh, my worldview in many respects, um, you know, as a young teenager starting also my first profession, my first job was teaching martial arts. So I had thought, you know, as a teenager in my 20s, I just had the assumption that I'd be teaching martial arts for the rest of my life, that that would be my career. And then in my late 20s, there was a diversion, kind of a, a change of direction. And, you know, so I realized at that point, okay, I'm not going to be doing martial arts for the rest of my life. So what am I going to do instead? And I, I thought about it and I decided, well, I need to, I need to get some academic background. I had a lot of hands-on experience, but I, I needed to get some, you know, some more academics, some more study. So I decided to go to university and I was very fortunate in that I live in San Diego and San Diego state university uh, has an excellent kinesiology program. Mm -hmm. So I decided I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into the kinesiology. And then, you know, from there, the fitness, the thing I loved about the martial arts more than anything as a young man was the training itself. Um, you know, I did the fighting. I did the full contact. Um, but that was never my motivation was not necessarily fighting. My motivation was the, the training itself. And that's what I, that's what I loved. I loved to work hard. I loved to push myself. So it was a natural transition. Um, and, 
I also was an early adapter in the kettlebell movement. So when kettlebells was kind of brand new, I was one of the first people to see the opportunity. And so it was a natural segue for me to, to have many, at this point, many years of teaching martial arts and people of different ages, children, adults, seniors. Um, there was a natural segue into the fitness for me. Yeah. Well, speaking of natural segue, you actually are um, leading to my next question. Um, you seem to have uh, had that coaching and passion within your blood from a very early age. Um, so, you know, how did that then spark um, your interest in building an entire fitness regimen with the kettlebell? You talked about being an early adopter. But so um, how did that say, OK, I'm interested in kettlebell and then that continue? And lead to the point where you're saying, okay, now I want to actually make this a business or make this an, an actual fitness discipline. Yeah, you know, it, it's time and place in a lot of respects. I think of, I've thought about that a lot over the years. In other words, if it were a different time and place, I may not have gone in the direction that I've gone in. You know, it was uh, uh, sometimes we can say these, this is destiny or fate that my life led me in, in a particular direction. Um, so initially it was my own interest, you know, so we, we start with the selfish, um, e even in the martial arts, when I started teaching martial arts as a teenager, it was, the idea was that I would be a better practitioner by, by teaching. Um, you know, so it was a selfish sort of motivation that, that you know, by teaching others, I get deeper into the material for my own, my own, uh, benefit. You know, now where I sit now, you know, at 49 and having a, you know, decades, decades of experience behind me. Now I understand really more what my service is, what my service is to humanity, what my service is to society. Um, you know, but I, I wasn't seeing that in the beginning. So we can look back and see how it formed. Um, Really, it was the opportunity. So when I say time and place, it was the opportunity. I was an early adapter. I had a, a rich background in the martial arts, so the movement culture. I had an appreciation for, we can say, a holistic approach where it's not, you know, bodybuilding. Uh, you know, because back in that time, this was before, um, you know, so I got in the arts in, in early 80, 1982. Uh, what we call functional training really didn't exist. Um, there wasn't, you know, what, what we call functional training to, to my recollection, kind of like the late eighties and early nineties is when we started seeing that terminology in the vernacular. We started seeing, you know, because e even as a teenager and probably in my early twenties, the, the source of information that people were going to would have been like muscle media, 2000, you know, the, the muscle mag, so it was still sort of riding off the the <laughs> glory of Arnold Schwarzenegger and what he represented and all the guys saying, you know, women were, you know, Joan Fonda in the, in the 70s was a big, you know, impactful. So it was the group aerobics. You didn't have, you know, CrossFit did not exist. Kettlebells did not exist. Um, it was early adapters, you know, guys like Paul Check and others that would just say, Hey, you know, we're not just training the muscles, we're training movement. Okay. But I consider that a previous era. Now what we have in functional trainings, we have that understanding of, okay, we're training movement, but we also have these tools like the kettlebell, uh, like CrossFit and this type of multi-modality cross-training, um, like things like mace and clubs and Bulgarian bags and, and, and heavy ropes, you know, that came from the John Brookfield, the battling ropes. Um, these things are ubiquitous in, in most gyms now, but it, that wasn't the case, you know, 20 years ago and before it, it was machines and free weights. <laughs> so, um, you know, the timing of it really was instrumental in that I had, you know, I had the, oh, sorry, I, I kind of got off track. Re repeat your last question just to get me back on track. No, that, um, that was great. I mean, kind of, um, we like the depth. It was just mainly just the um, how you um, took your passion and the opportunity for kettlebells and then decided to say, okay, I'm going to make a fitness regimen out of this. Just this. Yeah. Thing. So, so thank, thank. So yeah, it was really the, the opportunity was there, but I would be doing it anyway. 
And that's a big point of it is that I was personally interested from my own, like, hey, this looks like something that I would like. I related When I saw the kettlebell, I said, hey, this is something different. The martial artist in me recognized the value in that it's, you know, you're on your feet, you're, it's in your hand, you're using your whole body, you're training movements, it's explosive. The combination, the integration of flexibility and strength, not, not bodybuilding per se. You know, so it was, a, it was a, again, use the word segue. It was a natural segue. And then as far as me creating a, an organization, it was I had an aptitude for it. Um, mm-hmm. I, I love the kettlebell. I was able to learn it quickly because of my background in movement and martial arts. So it was, it was a new technique, but it wasn't completely foreign in the sense of using my body as a unit. You know, this is also synonymous with the martial arts. So, um, you know, and I was able to position myself as one of the one of the primary practitioners at that time. Plus, I had a, a very rich, diverse background in teaching. And, you know, so there was there wasn't really any models. Pavel was kind of the only guy. Pavel Satsalin was, you know, the only guy at the time. And so I, you know, Pavel and I got connected and I started working with him and I essentially said, well, I, I can be doing this, but I did it, you know, in my way, in a different way. And, and really where I went into it is I saw it as an opportunity for an international, uh, phenomenon. No, that's pretty good. So you basically took your, uh, personal passion and you, uh, were proactive and, uh, turned your personal passion into a professional, uh, endeavor. So that's awesome. Yeah. And, and really it's, you know, came in at the beginning of the intersection with internet and fitness Mm -hmm. together. And so that was the avenue to where now, instead of the business card, it's a DVD and you, you're a customer, you, Hey, what's this DVD with kettlebell? You, you see it, you like it. And now you're interested in my work. So maybe you send me an email and, Hey, I got your DVD. And if you're ever out in this area or that area, I'd love to attend your workshop, you know, so this is kind of how it got started. I, I considered it very organic and grassroots, except now our grass grows all over the world because the internet allows it versus, you know, your neighborhood necessarily that that's the only difference, but yeah, it, it, it started with a passion and then it just naturally led into, well, I got to make a living. <laughs> so let's figure out how to do these together. Well, that actually um, reveals your entrepreneurial spirit that even at the beginning, you always had a global uh, scope as far as the the potential reach of uh, uh, your passion. So that's cool. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. Because people are people and, you know, nations and borders, that, that's man-made, artificial. Mm-hmm. And that's the world we came from, but it's not the world we're going to. The world we're, we're, the world we're stepping into is a global experience and you know, it's only the technology or the limitations of the current technology that prevents us from connecting faster and easier. You know, the internet allows us, but it's still, we still got to get on an airplane and, you know, it takes a lot of work to get to the other side of the world. So it was, you know, part of that was my passion to travel and learn about the world. So I really integrated my interests all together <laughs> into uh, a viable sustainable you know professional path as well that's pretty good and that's that's uh that's i get i think the goal of every um one who, who is a professional is so you know do what you love and get paid for doing it so that's awesome i think so you know so and hopefully more and more i think i think now more and more people recognize it, it's sort of a, a perspective of life you know but there are there are individuals who they serve the dollar. The money is the thing. And so there are people that they'll take the money and, and sacrifice the happiness and the health. That's not something that I ever wanted to do. You know, I, I wanted it all together and, you know, um, so we have to make choices also. So, you you know, ideally, yes, I think probably most of our listeners would agree and, and that, that's an ideal that we want to be able to, to mix those things together. But some people they're more interested in the money and are willing to, you know, maybe do a job or do something that they don't love or doesn't make them happy, but Hey, they make the money. So they keep doing it. And, and, you know, that's perfectly okay. 
for, for some people, but it was never, it was never okay for me. It's not the direction that I, that I wanted to go in. Uh, uh, that makes sense. Um, and it seems um, that you found that, uh, that balance for you, that, that makes you tick. So, um, Moving on, Steve, what would you say, um, what one word um, would best describe your training philosophy and methodology? Holistic. Mm. Oh, that's, that's, a great, that's a great answer. Um, could you elaborate just a little bit on that? I well, understand. yeah, so we say the whole, so, so it's the whole person, you know, so tr- trying to encapsulate that verbally to be to to kind of cliche because these things become cliches and when you hear it enough it's mind body spirit would be a cliche way to try to describe that you know so the whole it's the whole body if we look at the physical it means that the we're not training individual muscles so if we're looking at just the physical education holistic versus non-holistic would be like comparing functional training with say body sculpting you know, okay. so I'm not just trying to shape my bicep, but I'm actually trying to work the, the whole pattern of the movement from the ground up, you know, so, so something like what we call functional. So that's one level of the holistic is that we're using the entire body, mm-hmm. like a martial artist, like an athlete. Uh, another component of the holistic is the whole is we are more than the body. So we have consciousness, mm-hmm. you know, so that's the holistic in that I'm doing exercise or I'm doing movement that is cognizant, that is uh, focused on what am I doing with my mind. In other words, I'm not just pushing a button on a machine and now I'm reading the newspaper and I'm watching the television while I'm exercising. Mm. You know, so that's that's I would say less holistic because your your body's going through the motion and the the monitor measures that okay I'm burning X number of kilo calories you know so you can't say that you're not getting exercise but I, I would say it's not so holistic because maybe you're reading you're looking at the stocks or your mind is somewhere else you know so holistic exercise is you are fully involved in the process and now it becomes a learning it's not just a, a metric that you're doing to get you know, X number of calories or a certain pump that you can look and see in the mirror. That That's one aspect. But beyond that, it's about, okay, this is what I'm actually doing. It's a practice. It's a okay. practice. And it, it stays with you after that, you know, 30 minute or one hour or 90 minute or however long your, your training session. So it's training versus exercising. Okay, you know, yeah. That's another level of holistic. And then we, we can take it even further because now we're looking, okay, the nutritional components and we're looking at the, what you can call well-being. So you have your mind, you have your body, you have your lifestyle habits, you know, what's your rest like, what's your level of stress, uh, how are you eating, and then even extending it more relationships and then extending it more your, your business and your professional life and you know, so that to me is what really the holistic is fitness as an avenue to something more, which is your health as an avenue to something more, which is your well-being. And then from that, it's becoming a global citizen where we're impacting our, you know, our family, our environments, and you just keep multiplying it bigger and bigger. So it's, uh, this is the vision that, that I have, you know, and that's what really motivates me now. Oh no. That, yeah. that seems like the holistic part of it element um, has the intentionality and an interconnectedness to it. So uh, thanks yes. for um, elaborating on that. Um, so um, you touched on this a little bit. Um, what would you say is um, the relationship between the mental and physical health and how are they related in regards to um, how you train with the kettlebells? So first of all, um, you know, so if I'm, if I'm taking a beginner and the, you know, the concept of mind body and, and how do you reconcile that or, or what are the cues, right? Um, cause you can say, Oh, pay attention. Well, pay attention to what? <laughs> so, um, not everyone speaks the same language and understands the directions. So, the first point is to understand that if, if we see the mind and the body as separate entities, which 
again, it may or may not be. There's different ideas about that, right? Because how do we measure this intangible, this thing called mind? And how do I identify it? There's no agreement on that. There's no agreement. Um, can we say the mind is the brain? Well, some say that the mind resides in the brain, but it's not definitive. It's a theory. Mm -hmm. So where do we start, right? And the thing, if we look at the mind and the body as separate in the sense that you can have your mind involved in what your body's doing, or your body can physically be doing something and your mind can be thinking about something else. So what's the, what's the unifier? And the unifier is the breath. So the breath is the median with which the mind and the body communicate. And so we can say that thinking about your breath and then coordinating the breath with the movement. And now we have an integration going on where the mind, the body, and the breath are now working harmoniously. And that's really the objective. That's the goal. That's a, that's a fascinating way to put it. I've never uh, heard that as far as the breath being the medium of communication between the mind and the body. That's awesome. And, you know, so yoga, the concept of yoga, which, again, it's become an umbrella term to the point where it almost doesn't mean anything in common usage because it depends on who you ask. You know, yoga has come to represent this series of anything from very simple to very sophisticated patterns of calisthenics. Mm -hmm. um, but yoga in essence means union. So in essence, yoga is the breath. Yoga is meditation. It's not about the movements that you're doing or the asanas, which are the postures, the positions that you can hold like a down dog or a cobra. Those are examples of common asanas. It's not the doing of those that makes it yoga, but that's, that's how it's become popularized. When you just pop in a local gym and they have a yoga class and you're doing these movements, that's one expression of yoga, but that's not the yoga and it's most simplistic. And the most simplistic, it's the breath. Mm. So it extends beyond just that stuff we call yoga. How I do kettlebells is yoga. <laughs> Certain kinds of martial arts practice is also yoga because it's the integration of the mind and the body via the breath. So that's the, you know, that's the, and, and one of the great teachers of our time, Wim Hof, the Wim Hof methods become very famous around the world, you know, he talks about the, the breathing, right? And Wim Hof is a guy, he's combining the deep breathing with the, you know, the ice and the cold water. And, um, you know, so there's, uh, there's a global awareness. There's an increased consciousness now as compared to even a decade ago about the significance of breathing and integrating that with the other things that we're doing is now, you know, I'm having a stressful day, I'm having a challenge or I'm, you know, in the middle of some, I don't know if I can say a, a shite storm, I guess, it's a, you know, in the middle of a, just a stressful situation. Well, you can go back into that. You can breathe, take that deep breathing and just oxygenate and kind of balance out the, the physiology, you know, alkalinize, alkalinize the system through the inhale and sort of de-acidify through the exhale. Now that gives us power. That gives us the ability to be present. And that's what it is. That's when we say the mind, it's the presence. Mm. Because yeah. now, now is what exists. Not that the past exists as memories. They're, they're, de they're, they're bits of data that sto are stored in this system, this computer system that we have, our body. You know, and so we can we can have a memory reflecting or a pain. A pain is a memory. It's it's stored as a or this idea of a future, like future think where I'm thinking of where I'm going or what I'm going to do. Right. So our mind can move. But physically, we are physically right here in the sensory world that we can touch and, and you know, smell and we, we can connect through our senses. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so to me, that, that's kind of, that's the topic of mind and, and what we do with it and how we use it. But in simplest form, it's about the presence and the way we stay present is through the breath. So, so whoever is listening and whatever you're doing, whether you're doing, you know, CrossFit or you're lifting heavy weights or you're doing, 
you know, kettlebells or you're jogging. It's where's my breath right now while I'm doing these movements? Where's my breath? And that all of a sudden gives you this, this depth of consciousness that, that you're not going to have if you're not thinking about that, if you're just letting your mind kind of wander, you know, putting on the, you know, the, the headphones and just, you know, zoning out. That's, that's kind of a difference in, in that way of understanding the, you know, what I call holistic. No, that, that makes sense. And so you seem to emphasize uh, proper breathing um, and, as, and proper technique as part of your training. Um, how else do you, how, what are some other ways that you um, emphasize or teach proper technique and flexibility um, while you're training? Yeah, so you have the biomechanics. So you have the you know biochemistry with you know through through the food and just the, the body's natural processes. And certainly, the breathing has an impact on our biochemistry in terms of the you know the alkalinity, the pH balance of our of our blood and our cells. You know, um, but when we're talking about movement, we're talking about biomechanics, and so. Mobility, you know, this is the area that um, there's so much range. There's so much range in terms of there's a difference between a practitioner and a teacher or coach, uh, you know, a a teacher, trainer, coach, which I don't identify them the same. But for for topic of of discussion, we'll say a, a teacher, trainer, coach you know, we, we'll kind of consider those synonyms. And then you have the, the practitioner, which could be the client, right? So for an exercise professional, someone's coming to the trainer. So how does that trainer teach proper technique? And the answer to that is, you know, we have an ideal, but the ideal, even the ideal is different for each person because our physiology is different. And this is one law about exercise science It's the law of individual differences. Mm -hmm. So even if everything is essentially the same, like gravity has a vertical pull upon all of us, you know, so we're we're fighting the ground and gravity is pulling us down. Um, That applies to all of us, you know, and, you know, the knee is a hinge joint and the shoulder is a ball and socket joint. I mean, that, that applies to all of us, but this person might have a knee injury or this person may have a shoulder injury. So maybe their shoulder is not working, functioning truly like a ball and socket. Maybe it's compensated or genetically your range of motion is simply deficient compared to a normal range of motion. Right. So, you know, or some person, one person is very tall. Another person is very short. One person is very thick and another person is very thin. So with all these examples, the biomechanics are not the same. So I can give, you know, the, the model to this person, but if it doesn't match their body, you know, if you're not six foot nine and built, you know, LeBron James is not my model because I'm nothing like him in, you know, in his physiology. So you can say, oh, do it like LeBron James does it, but there's no context in that, you know, so that that's where the trickiness and this is where why I don't use really templates. There's no, not, yeah, certain things for organizational and convenience, but there's really no templates in teaching and what I would say a path towards mastery because you have to develop your own method and what a good coach will do, they'll be able to identify mistakes and common, you know, they'll be able to identify major mistakes and, and help to correct them or point them out, bring them to light. But the individual has to develop the base, you know, so you need to have a degree of mobility. Um, And so there's no because if you're 12 years old and you're supple and flexible and you're naturally athletic, that's a totally different program than if you're 50 years old and you haven't exercised in 40 years and you've been sitting in a desk and, you know, you can't squat below parallel. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff I got to do with that person just to get them to where I would say ground zero to where, okay, now we can consider putting a kettlebell in your hands or putting a barbell over your shoulders. You know, it's not like everyone that comes in is going to do the same program. 
Okay, so you, so yeah, and that makes sense. So it's to a certain degree, a lot of the proper technique is going to be contextual and individualized. Yes, to- but we have our guy. You know, we want center of mass over base of support. Yeah, we want you know head over foot. If you want to dial over, don't dial it in even more. You know, but there's a difference between athletics and training fundamentally in in one aspect, which is locomotion, and this is an area that is not. I don't know if it's not understood or it's not, there's not enough expertise in this area yet. I think that the next phase of functional training, you will see the expertise developing more in the area of locomotion. Okay. You have n- nowadays a lot of experts in strength. Much the, the average trainer is much more knowledgeable compared to, I would say, a decade, two decades ago. You know, more people are at least rudimentary level. Um, knowledgeable about the basic barbell lifts, you know, quite a number even know the Olympic lifts. There's a lot of people that know the kettlebell. So in terms of the general exposure and understanding of strength training, I'd say that there's a lot of trainers that, that are that knowledgeable and have a lot of experience themselves and coaching it. But in terms of locomotion, I think it's still very far behind And there's a new age for that, you know, so because if I'm standing in one place and just lifting a weight overhead or against the bench or squatting it, it's not that it's not athletic, but there's not locomotion there. Mm -hmm. So that's not enough to make me the, the super athlete that's optimized the best that I'm going to possibly be in all aspects, right? Which is you got to be able to move from point A to point B. And that's, that's what separates athletics from, you know, working out training. Okay. Um, you know, and then you have the martial art, right, which is the fight. So fundamentally, if we go to our primitive instinctual, it's fight and flight, fight and flight. And all the other skills came out of that fundamental need of our ancestors is, you know, you got to hunt, <laughs> you got to defend your tribe. Or you know, or you got to flee if it if it's a danger and you can't overcome it, then you gotta you gotta get out of there. So right, those are the fundamentals: the fight and the flight. And now we don't have to do that on a primitive level because we live in these kingdoms, you know, these cities with the walls, and so that you know we're we're the dominant beast. We don't have to hide in the trees because the wildebeest is gonna <laughs> you know get us right. So we have luxury of leisure that our ancestors did not have. And the result of that, one of the results of the modern lifestyle is we have a disconnection from the physical. So you have things like obesity and inactivity. And and so we have to program exercise into our daily life to compensate for the fact that then the rest of our life, we're sitting in front of a computer and we're not, you, but we go back I'm not talking about the 40,000 or however long, you know, the early hundreds of thousands in uh, terms of hominids, but human history, what? I'm not an anthropologist or an archaeologist, but, you know, I think 40,000 years is is a pretty uh, fundamentally understood, if not longer. So we haven't changed that much physiologically, certainly not in the last 10,000 years. We have not physiologically changed from our ancestors but the way that we live and the way that we function is fundamentally different you know we we exist on two dimensions so we wear shoes we wear many times cushiony high heel cushiony shoes that are like coffins for our feet cuz you know the pros the pros are paid to sell to the joes right and we're not living the way our ancestors didn't work out for the most part unless they were warriors they didn't exercise they worked because if you're a farmer or you know some manual labor you're doing that 12 16 hours a day you're not coming out i gotta get my workout okay Uh, we do that now because you've been sitting in a in your car (laughs) for two hours or, or whatever so um anyway not not to get too far down now that but but the reason i bring that in is because we've had to learn these techniques because we've moved so far away from our fundamental hunter gatherer instincts and 
things that we did instinctually, we've forgotten how to do. So now the coaches have to bring people and they have to re-educate or remind you how to do the things that you instinctually knew how to do. Like, for example, you don't have to teach a child how to squat. You know, a, a toddler that can walk shortly after that, you know, they're going to be squatting. Well, pretty much at the same time when they're, when they're walking, they take their steps. And now they develop the confidence and they can walk. No problem. Drop the toy, squat down, pick it up, rock bottom squat, you know, perfectly upright. But the average, you know, 30 year old cannot even do a, you know, maybe can get to parallel. They get stuck. So the hip flexors have forgotten. So it's not something that I need to say, hey, I'm going to teach you an exercise called the squat. No, it's not an exercise. It's a fundamental human movement pattern. And you already know how to do it, but maybe you forgot because you haven't done it in 30 years because you've been sitting in chairs and your work and your lifestyle hasn't required you to go, you know, the toilet is at a right angle, the chair, the couch, the, the desk chair, the so, you know, everything is at the right angle. So that's my default range of motion. The body has stopped doing, so it's, right? It's, so it's more like a reprogramming and a re- yeah. Yeah. So the mobility is huge in the sense that why should I put weight on your skeleton if you're mechanically, your body's not doing it. Now I'm going to try to force you into the position with an external load. I think that that's irresponsible and I think it's a short term. And, you know, sometimes people get stronger and more fit, but inevitably they're either going to get injured and they're not going to stick with it long term. And it's about the long term. It's about the lifelong sustainability, not, okay, you're the stud athlete when you're 25 years old, but now you're 45 and having trouble going up the stairs because you sacrificed your cartilage in your knees from, you know, just doing too much and pushing it too hard, you know, and maybe not paying attention to the, the other, the recuperative. It's a balance, you know, the martial art, especially the Chinese martial art, it's the yin and the yang, right? The yin and the, and the yang, the balance, the idea of the balance. And, you know, so that's an important point. And that ties back to what I said earlier in the word, the holistic. The holistic is the balance because it's sometimes you got to push hard. You got to challenge yourself. Other times you have to, okay, I'm going to just do a light. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to train. I'm going to exercise, but I'm going to do it easy. I'm going to go for a light jog you know, just to, to sweat and move, or I'm going to, you know, today I'm going to just, you know, do some breathing exercises, you know, or I'm going to, you know, I want this, this donut, but I'm not going to get it. Instead, I'm going to have this green smoothie because I need the nutrition. You know, it's these types of decisions that we make in a moment to moment basis. You know, I love, you know, for business, I'd love to say, Hey, I got the program for you. And, you know, I want to sell 10 million of those programs. Everyone's doing the same program, but that's not for me. That's not intellectually honest because I know better because your program is unique for you. And my program is unique for me. So we got to do it. There's overlap, but we're not always going to be doing the same things. That makes sense. Yeah. You know, but, you know, mechanics, biomechanics, like center of mass, base of support, that, that's true for everybody. So we do have guidelines and, you know, alignment. When, when you go overhead, there's things that we look for. Like I, I want to have, you know, full extension in the elbow. I want the load to be vertically aligned over my, you know, over my base of support. So we definitely have mechanical guidelines that we look for as measurements. You know, the challenge is to get different individuals to get their body to be able to perform those those guidelines all right well that's very thorough um, <laughs> no, no that's good that's good now um want to ask you how do you measure success for your clients and then for yourself for myself i'll start with that uh for myself success is simply measured in continue continuous progress which means uh i measure that in fulfillment it can, you know so physically my measurement now is in the martial arts it's not it's no longer in a particular weight 
Like I want to be able to lift X number of pounds or a particular number of repetitions. Sometimes in certain training phases, I may have that like, okay, I'm going to like press that. this, you know, 30 times. I'm going to press this 30 times. And then when I get to 30, I'm going to increase the weight and then work up from 15 back up to 30. So for example, I can do that for myself. And so when I hit some, target metrics okay that's success and uh, most people will use fitness in that way like okay i'm gonna run a mile in this time i did it in six mi- minutes now next time i want to try to get a 558 mm-hmm. you know so so that's a way and i i'll use some of that but mainly it, you know for me i use in martial arts in terms of my performance in jujitsu and it's it's not even do that i submit somebody or did I, did I not get submitted? It's not that. It's, am I feeling it? Am I feeling it? Am I flowing? Oh, yeah, I, we're flowing real, real well. Because, you know, you're a warrior, I'm a warrior. So I might get you nine times, but it doesn't mean on the 10th time I'm going to get you. You might get me on that 10th time. You know what I'm saying? So I can't measure it that, oh, I was good nine, and on the 10th time I was not good because he got me. Because that's a comparison. No, I was good on the 10th time. You got me, but it was still, you know, we were, I was feeling it and it was a good one. And, you know, and you could have got me another time. Maybe I'm going to get you, you know, so that's the martial art. It's a continuous. It's not about a metric, you know, that is like I have arrived. And then I, I extend that again. Cause like I said, I'm holistic learning. If I'm learning, if I'm enhancing one aspect of my life, like sometimes it's money, boom, I I made a deal. So, okay, I'm doing some business here. That's a success, right? I'm I'm, I'm, I'm getting a, a certain amount of profit for that effort. That's a definite success. But also, hey, I learned some interesting things that I didn't know. That's also a success. So, you know, that's, I, I measure success in the, in the most important areas of life, which is, you know, family, it's relationship, it's business, it's health, it's, you know, fitness, it's no. community. That, that's how I measure success. And then, yeah, for each one, there are ways to do it. Now, for a client, we're talking fitness now. So bringing it back down to, to just the nuts and bolts. That's a lot easier because, um, you know, you keep records. So what's your goal? Oh, I want to lose 20 pounds by this date. Okay. So now I can measure that. I can measure the progress in that. Or, you know, what? You last week you were doing 30, but this week you got 40. I can measure progress. You know, so for me, I say that's pretty easy because I've been doing that my whole life. I've been, you know, in one form or another. And my system's a little different. I don't do personal training. You know, I work in seminar format. So what I try to do ultimately is I try to put the information inside because I see the client as the student. And for the large, you know, with some exception, there are, they're mostly fitness professionals. So you're a fitness professional. You're coming to my training. When you leave, I want to make sure that there's certain things that stay with you for the rest of your life. Even from that one exposure, that one day, you know, maybe we spend eight hours or we spent two days or we spent three days. So in that time, if I never see you again, there's certain things that you got from me that you're going to use for the probably the rest of your career, probably the rest of your life. So that's, that's how I measure success. But you know, it's hard to measure the way I know is maybe you come back and you tell me, so, you know, I, you know, I did your course 10 years ago and just want to tell you, I'm still using and thank you so much. You know, that's, that's what it is. That's what it is because it's, you know, it's a service. It's a, it's truly a service. And that's what we're here to do. That's what I'm here to do. You know, we're, we're here to help help each other uh, because you know life is uncertain, man. And and uh, we all we all have uh, victory and we all have loss. And it's like um, there is no guarantee because no matter 
the greatness that one can achieve and, and strive to, there will come a day when we all going to check out and do some, you know, go somewhere else. I, I don't know. I don't have all the answers. We don't, none of us really have the answers to what lies beyond. But one thing we know for sure is we don't get to pick the time and we don't know how much time we have. And probably we don't have as much time as, as we might assume. So it's like, and I, I think understanding what I'm talking about, it just comes, I didn't, have this understanding uh you know in my 20s and my 30s you know i'm close to 50 i have more understanding now because i have more experience now and you know so that informs everything else that i'm doing everything else that i do with fitness you know and of course i'm not it doesn't have to be so complex if you just want to get in shape there's way to do that but you know, I'm a particular type of teacher. I'm a, you know, and, and my area of interest, it shifts more into the individual and less into the fitness because I consider fitness sort of rudimentary. Yeah. And, yeah. and most people don't need to take it to the highest level because our lifestyle, at least up until now, for, for some people, yes. Like if you're in a war-torn country, now your fitness becomes all of a sudden more important because you got to get yourself and your family out of there to say, you know, yes, yeah, like if you're going into a boat, that's because the land is too dangerous. <laughs> so, you know, like we have all these political discussions about immigrants and stuff like that. Right. Well, it depends on what side of the equation you're, you're sitting on. Cause if you're the person now all of a sudden fitness becomes very important. But if you're living in, in the high rise, you know, downtown and you know, you have, you're going to Starbucks at a predictable time each day. And you know, your schedule is predictable at that point. Fitness is more of a leisure. It's a, it's a luxury, but you're not fighting with your body in, in a daily basis. Maybe you're fighting more with your mind. <laughs> we're we're fighting with our mind on some levels. You know, we have interactions and strategy and you know, so it's not that that we're not doing it, but most people in the in the industrialized worlds are not really using their body as their it it's their Yeah, okay. I guess what we have now is we have fitness as an opportunity for people that are not athletes or maybe are not able or do not want to continue in their athletic career, like they're athletes as children into their young adult. And then now my athletic career is over. So what am I going to do? Well, I'll be a trainer because I get to stay in the gym and I always liked working out anyway. Right. I think that's a large percentage of the fitness professionals, not all of them for sure. Sometimes it's a different story, but a lot, in a lot of cases, it's a natural segue. Even for me, in the sense of you know being a martial artist, and that was my first profession, and then okay, I'm not going to do that anymore. So I can, how can I simulate that? I can still work out. I can still train. So um, again, it's that segue. But I think because I've never not been fit, I've been involved my whole life. So for me, the idea like I need to do a workout to lose a certain amount of it never really entered my mind Mm -hmm. it never it was never a motivation it's just about the well-being and the health and and, you know so what i say to people like think about what are you going to be when you're if you're if you're 20 years old how are you going to be when you're 40 and 50 and 60 and 70 and that's really the and that's where i'm at like i don't do anything now that i'm not going to be able to do a decade from now or two decades from now, you know, or, or, you know, really if I'm training something, I'm training movement or I'm training my breath. It's that's it. I'm not, I'm not training for any particular aesthetic or a particular exercise just to say that I can do that exercise that I'm, there was times in my life where I was focused on that, but that's not something that now it's all about actually function. That's it. So some function that is immediately useful in my life. No, and, that makes sense. 
That makes yeah. sense. Be- because health is fitness is something bigger and health. So fitness is a part of health. The health trumps the fitness because mm-hmm. you, you can't be healthy if you're not fit. You can be fit and not be healthy. That's yeah. the difference. Like, because usually how we measure fitness is by looking, oh, that person's fit. You look because they look fit because they're tone or, you know, so you can be fit and not be healthy. Yeah. So, but in this day and age, it's very difficult to be healthy if you're not fit or at least have a certain level of fitness. So fitness is bigger and more all encompassing. And then beyond health, we have well being because you can be healthy without being well and so that's really what it leads to and it's the sustainability about are you going to be able to sustain this not oh i got this eight week program and i'm going to slim down for this challenge okay great but what happens when that eight weeks is over because that's going to be over and then if you go back to your old you're going to go back to the old, right? You, you know, so it's not, it's not sustainable and it's not permanent and it has to be permanent. So, you know, I've learned about types of teachers and, and my way is, is a unique way. I guess I, I'm not, um, I'm not in the, the cookie cutter model as far as, you know, if you just want to burn some calories and stuff, yeah, my stuff is great. And, and, and I can train anybody from, you know, the, 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 super obese inactive person that just wants to you know get going i can work with that person and i can take lebron james and i can help him too and any anyone in between because the the principles are universal but in terms of the greater work it's about the well-being more than the fitness because once once we get to a level of fitness then we use that fitness for movement of this vehicle and the vehicle is what enables us to do the work that we're here to do. So it actually ties into the life purpose and the physical education is, is very important as important, if not more than it's ever been in the history of humanity, because we're coming to a time where there's a lot of uncertainty for a lot of people, because we're coming into a time of the prevalence of the machine. And the machine is becoming more prevalent. And as a result of that, the adaptability of the human, not everyone has figured out how to adapt to that. And so you have a growing class of, how do you label it? You know, some some social scientists refer to it as a useless class, right? And it's like, you know, so all cities, we have homeless populations, right? I'm not saying homeless or useful. That's not the, but what I'm saying is we have a growing class of people or society of people who are people just like all of us, but they don't have any usable skills. They don't have skills of, you know, say technological skills or, or skills with their hands that enable them to make a living. And so now it's like everything's expensive and I don't have a place to live and I got to figure out where I'm going to get my next meal. And that's a real situation, and it doesn't affect me on that level, but it affects my my fellow humanity, my brothers and my sisters, you know, different parts of the world. So, you know, this is, I think about, this is the scope that I think about, and it's like, where does the physical come in is that's our foundation that allows us to progress when we have the well-being of the body and now the integration, the mind and the bodies, we have the possibility of creation. We have the possibility to grow and to learn. And, you know, and that's where the commerce and the business and the stuff like that, because if you have the ability to use your mind and you have the ability to use your body, you can make things and you can create things. And so now you're a productive member of society. So I think that, you know, on the other scope, maybe you're super productive in the sense of material wealth. So you have a lot of money and you have a lot of social clout, but you don't have control of your health. You're, you know, you're a multi-billionaire, but you're, you know, basically dying because you lost your well-being and you're alive, but your body is not thriving. So 
it doesn't escape us due to social class, whether you're sleeping under a bridge or whether you're, you've made it to the ultimate. And everyone in between, the physical education is, is a grounding force. So I think it's very important. And then you have, you know, you have the futurists and the biohackers and the Silicon Valley. You know, they talk about the, uh, you know, the singularity, right? So it's like when the machine and the man equals. And some people think it's futuristic, but it's not. Because like even Amazon and companies like that and Walmart are slowly, but it's faster and faster. And it's only a matter of time where, you know, it's not going to be people doing those blue collar jobs. It's robots now. It's yeah. robots because it's less expensive and it's less margin of error in a lot of, you know, administrative ways. So well, um, what's going to happen to, you know, okay, well, I was getting, getting a job flipping a burger or whatever. And now I don't do that. It's a drone, you know, and, you know, so the cream rises to the top. So you got to be the cream, but how are you going to be the cream if the body it's got to be healthy. So it's, it's not about fitness. It's not about just showing that's a level. And for some people it is, but once you get past that, there's other things in life. Cause it's like, there, there does come a point in time where is it about, I got to look a certain way so I can get the girl or I can get the guy, you know, that's like maybe a, a younger person, maybe, maybe an older person who's single and starting out, they want to attract, you know, so that's definitely a, a real part of it. It's like the, the aesthetic is a part that gets, I would say most people into fitness, yeah, you know, yeah. like, and, and so I'm not, it's not like I'm not aware of that. It's just that I see that there's a world that goes far beyond that. And right, you need right. to find a, it, it stays on brand for you. I mean, obviously that's on brand for you because everything is part of that holistic nature, as you said. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, all, all, you know, so you met your metrics for success is not just, it goes beyond just the, obviously the physical, but it's, it's holistic. So that makes sense. So you're, you're, you're factoring in all the global geopolitical aspects of everything. Exactly. You, because, because what I, because I want to help humanity, I want to serve humanity and, and it's the ultimate selfishness because in helping humanity, I help myself, um, you know, and that's not the, the, the only reason for doing it, but that's an honest reason. And that's part of the reason. No, that's um, genuine. I want to, yeah, I want to be respectful of your time. So, and I also thank you again for, uh, for agreeing with me, but I want to give you some, uh, an opportunity to, um, you know, promote, um, you know, your, your business, the international kettlebell, uh, fitness federation. So, um, give us a quick, uh, 30 second sound bit of what IKFF is. So the International Kettlebell Fitness Federation is the world's leading hands-on kettlebell education. Uh, it's a federation. It's myself. I have my team of master trainers around the world. So we provide in-depth hands-on education for fitness professionals and fitness institutions. Yeah. And where do you, how do you recruit your, your trainers to IKFF? How would someone become a certified IKFF trainer? We conduct courses around the world. Um, so the way that if someone that's listening to this, the way is to get a hold of me through IKFF.com. Also social media, it's Steve Cotter IKFF. So Instagram. Steve Cotter, IKFF. You can hit me up there, IKFF.com. And just inquire, just inquire because we have courses in different parts of the world. Uh, I'm running a lot of them. I have master trainers in different areas. And it can be individuals and it's also organizations. Sometimes I do it for teams. Sometimes I do this for, for gyms. Yeah, and yeah. so it's hands-on education. And I teach you everything you need to learn. Um, you know, that's awesome. And so what's unique for you about running a global business, global fitness business? What's unique is that there's a huge trust factor. It takes a lot of time to develop a team. And I have to really have a team of people that have 
been vetted and have, you know, a very rich skill set because there's physical component. You know, you have to have technical skill. And then there's the component of communication. You have to be an effective communicator, an effective teacher. And then there's the ability to trust. You have to be able to handle responsibility. So um, that's, you know, extremely exciting and and demanding. Um, The other thing is it makes me recognize the, it it makes me recognize the universal qualities that, you know, having it, it's afforded me the possibility to go around the world many times, you know, more than 60 countries and multiple laps. And I understand that people are more similar than different, regardless of the culture, regardless of the language or the region or, you know, the habits and the foods of the culture um, were more similar than different. And, you know, so it's been very instrumental in actually uh, shaping my worldview and shaping my life experience because it's given me that direct exposure. That I never would have had had I, you know, gone a different route in terms of opening a gym, you know, and staying in one gym on a day to day basis. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a great answer. Um, and now, finally, you know, again, thank you again, Steve, for your time. This has been great. Uh, uh, You're welcome. Thank you. Um, just want to know, um, as an entrepreneur, because we you know we get a lot of fitness professionals that um, read our uh, features, and so. Um, What's one thing that you as an entrepreneur wish you would have known when you first started that you now know, but you wish you would have known when you first started as an entrepreneur? Uh, Scheduling time, Uh, laying out the use of my time is really important. And that's something I didn't do for a a long time. (laughs) That's that's funny. Just uh, that, and that goes uh, that goes along with um, your, what you just said. The theme about um, no matter where we are culturally, um, there's more similarities than differences. And I feel like um, I ask that question a lot. And without fail, time management seems to be the biggest, uh, the most common answer, regardless of the profession, regardless of the discipline of fitness. Time management it seems to be the that. Uh, um, you know, that white whale that everyone's trying to catch as far as uh, perfecting that in their, in their business. So that, that goes right along with the, the commonality that we share. Yes, it echoes. Yeah. Well, thank you again, Steve, man. This has been great. Thank uh, we you, Shami. W- would love to feature you again sometime if there's anything new that you'd like to um, get, expo- get us exposed to here at Exercise Talk. Thank you again for that. Mm-hmm.